Hello, and welcome to another episode of the AOPEN Tech Playbook. Today, we're talking about one of the most hyped tech of the last five years, maybe even more. People have been talking about it forever. My name is Miles Schofield. I'm a lead solution engineer for AOPEN America. And what is so hype about this technology? People have been saying it makes gold, it'll pay all your loans. I mean, it basically does everything under the kitchen sink. So uh, this video is really about what it really does, uh, where the potential is, uh, and then talk about some of the challenges when using it in uh, our industry, which is sort of IoT. So uh, I'll allude to what it does, of course, very well in the typical use case, which is going to be cell phones. But uh, I'm also going to talk about traditional 4G uh, IoT integrations and, of course, how I see 5G integrations going. So let's get started. <clears throat> So let's talk about the hype uh, that we've been hearing about for, uh, I mean, I've been to trade shows uh, five, uh, you know, at least five years ago where people are saying this thing's going to be a hundred times better, faster, stronger. Uh, it does all this amazing things. And uh, yeah, it, it's uh, all the numbers are extremely, extremely uh, impressive, right? Uh, all this, you'll be able to download a whole movie in like 10 seconds, all this sort of stuff. So, but the proof is always in the pudding, as we say. Uh, you know, everyone remembers how the 4G was originally super hyped. So uh, everyone's waiting to see how the 5G technology progresses uh, until we actually realize how it's going to affect the market and certain types of technologies. So what is the primary technology? How do you get those 100% increases off of generally what is sort of a very similar type of problem? And the main problem that the technology is trying to solve uh, is solved by a technique called beam steering. So uh, when you have a cell tower, uh, it's trying to send someone a signal. Lots of people have signal in a lot of cases. And ideally, uh, you don't want to send the signal to everyone because then you can't use uh, multiple different types of signals because everyone's receiving the same one. So the way that you solve that is that you want to send the signal to only one person. So you can see that this top graphic here sort of shows you but by using a very complicated interference technique with multiple uh, antennas uh, rating, you can actually create a much more focused beam, uh, signaling beam, uh, to track an individual user. And this is the major, major, major difference with 5G. So you can see that if you can use uh, these, uh, these main lobes uh, to track an individual user, and you can use the same type of frequency to address multiple users in the same space, then you're gaining tons of uh, uh, efficiency and bandwidth right there, right off the bat. So uh, this technology, of course, have been around forever uh, in science and military applications. So it's really nice to see this uh, coming to uh, mainstream type of technology like cell phones. Uh, the bottom graphic, you can see that uh, the way that these lobes are used is that it can generate a scanning pattern, find a device like a cell phone, and then track it and the cell phone actually tracks the uplink tower as well. So once again, you get much, much higher directional uh, efficiency and user efficiency out of this type of technology. Uh, the reason why this took so long and why this technology is so difficult is because uh, if you want any sort of scanning or tracing type technology, uh, you normally would just use some, some uh, something like a motor or like a spinning uh, device or anything like that. But the the issue is is that those things break a lot and would require a lot of service and maintenance in cell towers is very expensive. So this sort of solid state beam steering is the core of uh, 5G uh, technology. So the other the way that this represents in terms of a data uh, catchphrase is that they say that the new technology is massive MIMO. So MIMO has been possible in the past, but they're calling this one massive MIMO because uh, it being able to individually address users allows much more conversations effectively to happen at the same time. Uh, so you can see with a legacy on the left, you were basically sending the same thing to absolutely everyone. So you could only talk to one person at a time. But now uh, that you can address each user individually, you can talk to each uh, person individually. And that's where you get the major, major, major gains. Right. <clears throat> So what's the downside that no one talks about? <laughs> what's under the rug? Uh, the initial testing of a lot of 5G equipment shows that uh, it does prefer line of sight, right? And so this is going to be the big limitation in trying to solve a lot of the uh, in-home or in-building IoT issues uh, because uh, this seems great for mobile and remote applications uh, and uh, driving applications. Absolutely fantastic. But when it comes to getting around corners of apartment buildings and buildings and retail sites, and things like that, you may have to use additional technology to get it work. But we'll see uh, if that technology is particularly developed. So I'm going to talk about that uh, a bit more. So let's talk a bit about how uh, cell 
uh, networks work in general. So the, you have to, when you have hardware, it has to identify itself to the cellular network. The cellular network can accept it or not. It has numbers like the IMEI number, which is this uh, number like a MAC address on the chip itself. Also, they use SIM cards, and it's all been embroiled in this sort of, uh, you know, the, we, we used to, five years ago, every device used to be locked, and then they came out with legislation, and it's all sort of mess. But the, the bottom line is that carriers can definitely mess up this technology. And for the most part, it seems like, uh, especially U.S. carriers, specifically only are blocking and limiting technology growth in the cell phone market, which really doesn't address IoT. So I'm not really worried because uh, there are completely separate services for IoT as well. So, But just to give you an idea, these are the two primary uh, uh, ways that they can, uh, they can control what actually has access to their primary cell network that all the cell phones are on, right? So... If you have these sort of, uh, if the carriers have this choice of what uh, hardware and what systems uh, to let onto onto their uh, their network, how are they actually certified and controlled? Controlled. Well, cell phones are pretty straightforward. I'm for sure you're pretty uh, familiar with them. Uh, is that they have chipsets in them that support, you know, if it's a U.S. cell phone, U.S. bands and Theoretically, if the uh, cell phone supports the bands uh, for the carrier that you're trying to access, it should work, right? Most people say if that if you unlock your phone, uh, it should work with any other carrier, provided the chipset uh, does work with another uh, the other carrier as well, too. So, uh, and it would make sense for se uh, cell phones to work cross carrier, right? If you have a device and you unlock it, there's no reason for uh, competing cell networks to not re uh, uh, not support a chi chipset used in a very popular phone. However, the issue is is that let's say you want to put in a 5G stove, smart stove, or a 5G light bulb, and there's a hundred brands. Is Verizon gonna or or, or T-Mobile gonna go out there and certify all 50 of these little chipsets that you put in a smart li 5G light bulb? Probably not, right? And so the IoT devices, uh, because they're not going to represent a massive uh, uh, type of data market like cell phones, are going to need to be controlled in a much different way. And that's why you don't see a lot of 4G independent sensor devices like a chair sensor or things like that. Most of those are run off of local WANs uh, connected to a 4G router. So I'm going to talk a bit about how that works. So the primary application... The way that IoT cell works today is that it's almost always a disaster to try and put individual uh, modems in every single device, right? Uh, we've seen some of that in the past where you try and put a 4G modem, those little USB ones and a million digital signage screens or point of sales or things like that. Yeah, it's usually pretty messy. Um, so what most people do is they use uh, what's called a router. Uh, and with special plans like uh, so instead of buying trying to register it like your cell phone or like your a tablet to your Verizon account you have specialty uh, accounts that are better fit to managing like a hundred engine sensors or a hundred light sensors or thousands of light sensors and things like that so there's separate types of cell companies that that sell plans and services specifically for these applications and hardware as well too. So this one's a cradle point router. Uh, they make really great uh, solid state um, for, uh, 4G and now 5G routers. Uh, and we work with them on projects. Uh, we've worked on, with them in projects in the past. Uh, really good company. So they not only uh, have the cell phone service itself, but also that router that then links to all the devices. So this is a typical setup. You know, you're going to have the NetCloud, which is effectively the quote unquote Verizon. Uh, uh, and then, uh, or the data service provider, uh, it goes to that little um, cradle point box uh, uh, over 4G. And then once it gets to the box, it's distributed via uh, a typical uh, uh, Wi-Fi router to a whole bunch of devices. It can go to uh, your digital signage, it can do uh, to your sensors, all that sort of stuff. So this is the typical setup that you're going to see uh, um, in these type of applications, retail um, QSR, transportation, all this sort of stuff that you see in these graphs. The real, uh, the, the real uh, uh, initial technology push that I'm excited about is not necessarily the, the 
uh, innovation is going to bring to your cell phone. If any, anything, I think your connectivity is probably going to be worse on 5G due to the line of sight issues, especially if you live in a concrete jungle or a big city with skyscrapers all over the place. The the thing I'm really excited about is is fixing that last mile, right? The 5G showdown where we're finally going to have, you know, for people who live in rural areas, you know, we have a lot of people moving outside the city, working from home now, they're going to be finally able to have choices in their data services because you're going to have satellite uh, via companies like Starlight, uh, Starlink. You're going to have, uh, of course, cable available from Xfinity if they manage to make it out there. Uh, and then the last one, of course, is that uh, in the bottom right here is the Verizon 5G router. And that was the sort of implementation I talked about earlier where uh, you're going to buy a Verizon pl plan for this little box on the back. And then uh, and then uh, it's basically you can you can use it like a regular Wi-Fi wi router, except you're going to have a uh, a Verizon plan for it instead of Xfinity. So um, so you'll actually have three choices if you're in a rural environment. You should have three choices in terms of your data connectivity, and 5G should work uh, great in those type of situations in terms of cleaning up all those rural customers, which have been so hard to address in the past. Uh, uh, for ISPs. So that's where the initial excitement is for me, not necessarily IoT. The throughput could affect IoT a lot, but we'll see uh, that as well. So to wrap things up, I know 5, 5G is obviously a massive uh, uh, topic. Uh, you can talk about individually bands, which are designed for different applications, like there's specialty bands for when cars talk to each other and uh, all traffic coordinates and things like that. So there's a lot of plans for the technology, but once again, we're going to have to see how uh, businesses and companies end up implementing them. So to wrap it up, uh, 5G, that primary uh, technological change is that beam steering allows for way more data and user throughput. Uh, way more channels uh, and uh, businesses. I don't think they're going to mess with IoT as much, but we'll see if the uh, U.S. remains progressive on unlocking your phone and making sure that uh, the chipsets are widely supported across carriers and things like that. Uh, IoT, I think, is going to be initially the same. We're still going to see a lot of uh, 4G routers. We're just going to see 5G routers now. Uh, it's not going to change much, but probably about the 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 sensor density that you'll be able to place in some of the applications, so for larger office buildings and stores and things like that. Uh, and then the last one is uh, the one I'm excited about uh, is, of course, bringing more competition to uh, the rural service areas just for general inter internet. I think that's going to be one of the biggest initial impacts. So uh, that was it for today. Thanks for joining. I hope you learned something, and I'll catch you next time.